Okay, uh, so I'm going to go over a couple of things. Um, uh, Atticpe had expressed some interest in developing a bytecode machine for um, uh, for rolling, and so I wanted to talk about a pipeline, a compiler pipeline um, that um, would be correct by construction. Um, for that, uh, but before that, uh, and I'll, I'll just give kind of a high level description to this time and maybe go a little deeper next time. Um, so the, the uh, but before I do that, I want to um, just quickly go over kind of some new calculations. Um, so uh, with respect to the OSLF. Uh, so let me do a quick screen share. So um, essentially, what we're working on now. So we, we have we have a notion of um, sub uh, um, sub category, um, and. Uh, so I'll quickly review that. So, so sub, sub Q category. So the idea is you've got some quantal uh, and then a set together with a relation on that set uh, that is Q valued. So a Q relation that is transitive and reflexive um, is, uh, which basically means that uh, you have the, since, since it's Q valued, Transitivity means that it's kind of the dual of a metric space. So you, you've got you got the dual of the triangle inequality. So um, uh, and then and then the uh, uh, the uh, relation the, the relation is also bounded uh, is uh, um you know the if you've got some x a then um a of x x is going to be above the unit of the quantile so that's those are the conditions so that gives you a q category and um what we're what we are looking at we can now develop a q uh, um, a power object of the q category um so in particular, for each one of these kinds of relations here, um, so, so notice that it's parametric in two relations, um, then you'll, you'll get these, uh, you'll get either it's all additive or it's all linear or it's mixed with the additive on the outside or it's mixed with the linear on the outside. So that's those are the four possibilities that are available. And then you can, um, uh, then you can define a, uh, a power set uh, or a power object, right? So the, um, but that's one for each of these different kinds of, of uh, relations here. So um, this, again, since we're going to be a, um, a Q, category so we want this power thing to be a q category so it's going to have a set part like the x and it's going to have a relation part like the a um and then the set part is just the set of all the sub uh, q categories here and then the relation part um is is given this way so for uh, for this kind of power object, you'd use this relation. Um, and, you know, if for the other kinds of powers, power sets for this one, you'd use this relation and so on and so forth. So that gives you, that gives you a notion of a power object that extends to the, um, and, and now, now what we're doing is working on the calculation that extends the power object to the maps so that we can calculate a pre-image, right? So in order to get the for all and there exists, in this setting, what we want is a, a uh, the, the, 
the for all is going to be the pre-image and the there exists is going to be the saturated pre-image if i've got that right i may have it backwards as usual but anyway that's that's uh, where the calculation is going i don't expect there to be any serious difficulties um, now that we've got everything all sorted out um any questions about that All right, hopefully that was all crystal clear. Okay, um, I'm gonna take a quick moment to bring up paper, hang on one second. So there's a, uh, a researcher by the name of Oliver Danby uh, and he did some work um, on a pipeline from um, continuation passing evaluators to abstract machines. All right, so let me just share my whole desktop and then it'll be easier. Okay, so if you just type into Google Oliver Danby abstract machine, you'll get a bunch of different hits um, because this research program has been going on for a good 20 years. Um, one, of the papers that has come out of the basic research in computer science group is this paper, a functional correspondence between evaluators and abstract machines. So it's useful. So you can see that this is the group uh, that's been working on it. These are all colleagues of Danby. It was really Danby's observations that kicked off this line of research. Um, and uh, I think this is one of the more um, recent papers. Um, so the idea is you're gonna start with, let me sketch this out. Okay, you're gonna start with a continuation passing. So this is a continuation passing evaluator. Uh, and then you're going to pass from there through some reasonable steps to an abstract machine. So we'll talk about the difference between an abstract machine and other kinds of machines. And then, um, and then what Danby doesn't talk about, but it's quite easy to go from an abstract machine to a bytecode machine. Right. So then this the the input here is um Rolang, for example. It would be whatever your language is, but you pass Rolang into a continuation passing evaluator. Notice that um our implementation doesn't really do compilation. The most it does is normalization. Um, so it takes a normalized expression and runs it through an interpreter. So that's, and if you think about the way our interpreter works with respect to the, the tuple space, um, there's a close connection between that and a continuation passing evaluator. Um, and then, uh, and, and so you can apply Danby's program to get from here to here, and then it is really quite straightforward to do a bytecode machine from here to here. Um, so the, the the value of this is um, that all of these steps are completely um, defined. There's no guessing. There's no invention. There's no um, you know. There's, there's no design choices of any substance to be made. Um, and, and we know that the, the transformation between each step is correct. So from here to here is correct. And so that fits in with the um, uh, correct by construction methodology that I've been suggesting for a long time now. So before I dive into more details, I want to 
check and see if everyone understands what I'm talking about. Any questions about what we're, what we're saying here? Uh, so our current implementation uh, is that the continuation passing evaluator uh, is that in that level? Yeah, the, the, cur the current implementation stops here, right? So it just runs this thing. Uh, so uh, what's the value of this uh, uh, abstract machine? So that's something like a, uh, like an intermediate step uh, to derive the, uh, you know, the final uh, body code machine. Right. So, 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 I mean, obviously you can have, you can build interpreters, right? So that's what this right. is. This is an interpreter and our implementation is basically just an interpreter. To get to a bytecode machine, you have to take more steps. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I have a question related to, uh, so you, you, you said that there is no uh, design choices, but uh, from, from the perspective of complexity, uh, is there a, a difference? I mean, you, 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 you might, you might do further optimization, right? But what, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting as a, as a development methodology is first you get it correct, then you optimize. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Because, you know, one of the, you know, you know, most common rookie mistakes is early optimization, premature optimization. Yeah. Um, so in the current implementation, the abstract machine is the JVM. No, the there's, there's the no machine is JV, what, what is the role of JVM in this? The way you laid out here, it's it's just providing the code. The JVM provides the code on which in which you write this thing. And, and also to as, as a host to to evaluate uh, primitive yeah. operations. Exactly. Yeah. So if you were to do like say for LLVM or something. How would this picture look? Where does the... again? It's the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that th that's a hosting environment. What we're talking about is making something that you could you could potentially map this onto hardware, right? That's another. This is another path to hardware. This this thing is you know literally bytecodes. So you could so so you can you can either you can either use a hosting environment like the JVM or LLVM uh, to then execute this. So you would then map this onto LLVM, or you could map this onto LLVM, or you can map this onto LLVM, and and vice, you know, and similarly for Java or C or whatever, right? E each one of these could go. You have a path from each one of these onto modern hardware. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking, basically the interpreter is a realization of the abstract machine, is it not? The... No, no. Um, the, 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 the point is that the interpreter is um, a less, uh, in some sense, it's a less efficient implementation than the abstract machine. But, but the correctness of the interpreter is only, uh, it, it's correct only if it truly reflects the abstract machine, is it not? In, 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 meaning abstract machine presumably is a fully correct um, spec of the language. No, and, the, uh, the, the continuation passing evaluator is a fully correct implementation of the language. This is a standalone thing. Mm -hmm. okay. right? It's not defined with respect to these things. This This is a well understood notion of, of evaluation. If you've ever implemented Lisp in Lisp, which is like, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. functional programming 101, implement Lisp in Lisp. Well, one of the ways to do a Lisp interpreter in Lisp is using, you know, a continuation passing style evaluator. So Rolang is well set up for a continuation passing style, right? And basically, all the four comprehensions are your continuations. <laughs> yeah. right. so you, you got an, you've got an environment, which is the tuple space, and the environment stores a bunch of continuations and a bunch of data. And that's it, that's all there is to it. Right. What, uh, what, you, go ahead. Can, yeah, can you provide some examples of the uh, abstract machines? 
Yes, that was what I was gonna. That was what I was gonna do next. Um, but I wanted to make sure we had any uh, we, we had other questions before we do the next level of detail. Uh, so let's take uh, uh, Ethereum for example, right? So uh, uh, the Ethereum, Ethereum, is not, Ethereum is not a good example um, uh, be, because. It isn't done in a correct by construction style. It's a hand design machine, right? Right, so there, right. There so, isn't a continuation of value. There isn't a continuation passing evaluator that's upstream from the EVM. Right. I mean, their EVM is in the by the code machine level, right? So yeah. The, the EVM is, is down here. It's a by right. hand by code machine. And the relationship between this thing and Solidity, which would stand in the role here, they is escape all the steps. Is completely hand wavy. There is no proof of the correctness of that compiler. Uh, I think what uh, Etik uh, means by um, byte code level is not really the, uh, the 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 byte code. I think you 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 are talking about because uh, on uh, ABM defines uh, op codes for for uh, solidity operations, right? But this is yeah. not completely the byte code level of machine. This is more like uh, uh, no, no, a level of no, this is exactly uh, the same. There'll be a bytecode level that is not the same as, like to get to modern hardware code, this would be another step. Right. So this, this is an exactly the same analogy to the, to the uh, AVM bytecode machine. Mm, I it's, see. Just, it's, mm -hmm. it's just that their, their thing is hand constructed. It's by hand and it's not derived from solidity. Mm -hmm. I see. Right. So it's just a. It, there's just there's the EVM machine. There's solidity. There's no spec for the semantics of solidity, and even if there was, there is no relationship between the semantics of solidity and the bytecode machine, uh, the of the EVM that that uh, that one can rely upon to prove the correctness of the compiler. And without the proof of correctness of the compiler, there are all kinds of bytecode injection attacks that could be happening in a malicious compiler. For example, it's halting hard to determine if there are um, extraneous um, transactions squirreling away ETH, right? A malicious compiler could be doing exactly that and nobody would know. I mean, I, I see the relation uh, uh, in in our case when uh, for, when we have uh, the rolling uh, AST, uh, this is basically the the the, the bytecode. I mean, uh, when when it's translated to, uh, with the protobuf, we basically have the stream, uh, which we can uh, interpret it as a as a, a, a opcode. Uh, you, you, from... you you can get there, but that that's also. Um... That's just the fact that Rolang is so simple. If you had a really mm -hmm. complex language like Java or Ada or something, the AST is not going to correspond to bytecodes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. There was a thing called uh, uh, minimal core calculus for solidity that was published, though. I don't, I mean, this may have been an afterthought. It was definitely and, an afterthought, yes. And, and I'm not sure how um, fully it reflects the actual code that is out there. But yeah, uh, and, and the, the, but the main thing is what, what is the, you know, is the compiler factored through that core calculus? And if it's not, then it's, you know, it's just like, it, it's an academic exercise. It's not the, you know, like what, what I'm trying to do is to drive production software through a particular pipeline so that we don't have to post facto prove the correctness. As we're mm -hmm. developing the software, it is correct <laughs> to the best of our ability, right? The weak link is whatever language you're coding in. So in, in the case of Java, there are known issues with Java and correctness. In particular, inner objects do not have a well-defined semantics that is accepted by the entire community. So that's the, that's, that's the issue. So um, the extent to which we have a correct implementation environment, we would get a completely correct implementation, right? Because you know, 
this part is correct, this part is correct, this part is correct, and the code that the 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 host language which is allowing us to implement this, that's correct. And so then you only have to prove, you know, uh, that that you've done the the correctness here, and you've done the correctness here, and you've done the correctness here. And if you if you have all of those links, then you know that your implementation is correct completely, and you don't have to do a machine proof because you did it as you were building it. Otherwise, you have to build a machine proof, and that becomes costly and time consuming. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. So I have a I have a general question. So uh, let's okay. say we we build a bytecode machine for Lola, and we decide to deploy this on the on the uh, uh, blockchain. Uh, so is that we we introduce the risk of this bytecode uh, injection attack? If the bytecode machine has not been proven correct, yes, you you risk a bytecode injection attack. I see. Yeah, I mean that's that. I mean, and it's 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 the the, the risk is moderated by um, you, you you can make sure that whatever code is used for the compiler is signed and so whoever's using the compiler they're all using the same compiler so that that puts the risk kind of inside one bubble right so if the ethereum foundation is malicious or whoever whoever you've trusted to build the compiler whether it's ethereum foundation or some third party right that's where your risk is um and so if there are multiple implementations which there are right right so there's a there's a Rust implementation, there's a Go implementation, there's a Java implementation, there's a Python implementation. So each one of those has had to provide a compiler. So, and there is no comparison uh, across the compilers, right? So that, that spread, that means that the risk keeps going up and up and up. Whenever there's a new client, the possibility that there's, that there's a bytecode injection attack goes up. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. Yeah, so currently, uh, so uh, basically, we we are uh, we are, we directly deploy uh, Lowland uh, uh, into the blockchain, right? So, like uh, Ethereum, they uh, deploy bytecode, uh, the you know the compiled uh, bytecodes into blockchain. So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, whether or not we we have this bytecode injection is the compiler. Is on the chain or off the chain? Uh, is my understanding correct? So, so, so the whatever the so if you store the byte code on chain, then you it's kind of too late, right? The byte code injection attack happens at the compilation stage. So, are we in, any further questions, or should we go to the next level? Uh, yes, I'm okay so far. All right, all right, so, um, so again, I, I, I strongly recommend that you, um, uh, you, you take a look at this paper because they go through several different examples. Um, so for example, they go from a call by name evaluator to the Kriven abstract machine um, and then they go uh, from the CEK machine uh, uh, to a call by evalu eval evaluator. So that's that's running in, in both directions. Um, then they define an, another, um, the CLS abstract machine. The, the most standard, um, the most standard functional abstract machine is called the SECD machine. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, so, so let's, let's begin there, right? So let's take a look at the SECD machine. That's page 18. All the code here is written in terms of, uh, OCaml. Uh, so o OCaml is one of the parent languages, uh, or, uh, is it OCaml or ML? It might be ML. They're, they're, they're very close. All right, so let me just find the page. Okay, we're at 14. This is the, the um, transition rule. So a 
a um, an abstract machine has some number of registers, uh, and the transitions define what you do in terms of the registers. Um, so this is your uh, stack. This is your environment. Um, this is your continuation, uh, and this is your dump. Okay, so that's so that's what uh, that's that's the way to think about it. Um, so, if you have some term, this is at the top. Then, um, to load it into the machine, uh, this is the transition that loads it into the machine. So you start with a nil stack, a nil dump. Um, you put T onto the continuations, and I can't remember what MT is here. Um, uh, yeah, I have to, I have to go back and remind myself. Likewise, um, if we have, you know, no, no continuation to pass this off to, and we've got a value sitting at the top of the stack, then, then this is how we grab the value out. Right. So now then the, the transitions are, suppose we've got some stack, um, some, uh, environment, uh, X is sitting at the top of the continuation um, stack and the dump is D, um, then we then what we do is we go and grab the value of X from the environment of E and we stick it on top of the stack. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So here, if we've got some closure um, sitting on top of your continuations, um, then we will form um, this kind of closure object um, and put it on top of the stack. If we've got uh, an application expression, um, then uh, we convert that to a call to apply. Um, and if we have an apply sitting here, a closure here and a value here, right? So, so apply is the thing that we're going to do. Here's our closure operator. Here's our value. That's what's sitting on top of the stack. Then we're going to update um, the environment so that X is bound to V um, and T will now be sitting on top of the um, continuation uh, and uh, SEC. So remember over here we had S, E, and C. That's going to be stuck on top of D. Right. So so this gives you a sense of, of how you would end up with the these two lines give you a sense of how you do evaluation. Um, and then here, if we have uh, uh, this sitting on top of D and some some value here. And if your um, continuation is nil, then um, we will move the, uh, the um, this becomes your dump, the C prime, let me see, where's the C prime coming from? I think there's a bug. Yeah, this should be a C prime not a D prime. Yeah, that's a typo. So then the, the C prime will move into the continuation slot. E prime becomes your environment and uh, S prime takes over your stack with, with V on top. So that's the entire abstract machine. And now um, just informally, you can, you can imagine that each of these transitions has a byte code associated with it. Does that make sense? So for every kind of transition, you can associate a byte code and then you can do your standard byte code interpretation. So this is the least, so getting from an abstract machine description to the byte code description is trivial. Is that making sense? Uh, so my understanding is this, uh, this uh, abstract machine, so uh, it had this uh, quadruple, right? And, and also this uh, transition rules, right? So you have uh, both of them, 
you define uh you, you define the uh, abstract machine right yep yeah that's exactly right so next step is translate everything into the byte code yeah and so the the translation into byte code is for for each of these different kinds of transitions so for each kind of right. error you're going to have a byte code and then the, the 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 byte code is going to assume that the registers have a particular shape right uh, so, and uh, we only uh, and this is uh, defined for la uh, lambda calculus and we need to find uh, you have to uh, do something similar for the row, row calculus. calculus now now the tricky part is this works because it's single threaded so you have yeah. to you have to make some you have to make some modifications to Danby's program to deal with multiple threads. Right. So the simplest thing to do is you have multiple copies of these registers, and then you have to make some decisions about how values, in particular, how an environment might be shared across the registers. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So, um, so uh, if you if you um, this basically just codes up that that machine there. Um, so, and then what they do is they 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 give a notion of an evaluator that corresponds to the SECD machine. So I won't go through this this now. We can do that at some other time. But um, but also I, I recommend that you know before next week just take a look at this, um, and uh, and and you'll get you'll get a sense of how to go from a continuation passing evaluator uh, to the SECD machine. Um, and and the important point in all of this is that you get these kinds of things for free, right? So the, the, all, I mean, the reason we go through all of this mishigash is for these kinds of propositions, these full correctness propositions, right? That, that's, that's why we do this, so that we, we don't have to later go back and, and, and stumble over someone asking whether or not we have proved that we don't have any bytecode injection attacks. Um, so, so, you know, b basically what I've given you is the overarching, um, view, right? So the overarching view is here's the pipeline. And I've said why the pipeline is interesting or important. We've walked through an example in terms of the standard, you know, machine for functional programming languages. And then we've talked about informally how to turn a machine like this into a bytecode machine. And we've talked informally about how a machine like this might be modified to deal with uh, concurrency. Any questions at this level? Okay, all right. So uh, with that, I will... Um, I'll leave you guys, you know, for a week to go and kind of take a look at this. And, uh, um, and, you know, come back with any questions and then we can go a little deeper. Does that sound reasonable? Uh, yes. So, yeah, maybe we can, uh, yes, yeah, possibly we can uh, provide some hint like how to, uh, how to convert this into the lowland uh, framework yeah i mean my, my recommendation is you know just start with start with a, translating this evaluator into scala right um because this is going to be much simpler than rolling right and then rolling will, will be a small small um uh step forward in terms of complexity over this right so you want to you want to think about you know just a core rolling evaluator and then how you might go following danvi's recipe to a machine like this 
right? And uh, yeah, my, my, my last question here is, you know, uh, this is uh, the full collection. This is only, only proved uh, on, on this uh, uh, lambda calculus, right? Right, uh, so, 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 you, so you, ha you, have, you have to make sure that this transformation, so uh, let's do this. You have, to, you have to make sure that the evaluator that you've got here um, uh, uh, essentially follows the, uh, the recipe, including right. your extensions, right? So you'd have to, you have to, you have to come up with um, the corresponding evaluator that's going to give you your, your um, concurrency and then how that concurrency maps onto modifications of a machine like this. Yeah, so after, after that, I, I mean, after we introduced the concurrency uh, from, the, from the low calculus, uh, the, the, the full correctness still holds, so we needed to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, prove the conclusion again. The, um, it, the, 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 if, you, if you factor the um, extensions in the right way, then the then the the correspondence goes through. Um, you may have to prove something about that factorization. So so in particular, you're going to have some kind of monoidal structure, which is your thread structure, right? Which is going to, for example, um, you won't. So uh, if you have um, uh, if you have parallel expressions here right so so no, so notice that all of your lambda calculus expressions are here so if you extend these with parallel expressions right so so here you you would have um uh outputs and inputs and pars right and and that's going to have to correspond to well or it may correspond to depending on how you do this to um to parallel versions of these four tuples, right? And and so uh, so that's a that's a, a natural factorization. And if you if you've done that factorization appropriately, then there's only one um, one place where you might have to extend the the correspondence, right? Which is just at that uh, uh, just at that level. Uh, so essentially, the 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 proof obligation is reduced to a, a tiny little surface area. And, and once you've proved it, you've proved it once and for all, for all abstract machines that enjoy um, this construction where you, you, you have parallel versions of the registers and you have parallel expressions on the inside. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, all right, that's the, that's the idea. Um, I'm not saying that this is easy. Uh, uh, it's, there's certainly uh, some research uh, here. It's not rocket science, um, but it's much, much better than doing this by hand, right? So if you, if you, if you jump straight to here, without some framework, then we have a lot of proving to do to show that going from here to here is correct. Now, if, if one were to complete what you just uh, described and do a Scala version of that uh, evaluator, Mm -hmm. Do we end up with something like what we have now in the evaluator, or is it going to be in some ways better than what we have? Uh, so, I mean, the evaluator we've got is as close to sort of the paradigmatic version of this as is possible, given the fact that Rolang is not Lambda. Um, so, so the, the, the trick is to 
the, the trick is to um, go, you know, is to extend the correspondence to this and then extend the correspondence to that. Uh, so, so that's the idea. Um, we've, we've got one of these that's going to correspond to um, this thing. Right, and Danby's Danby's um, point is that if this is in the right shape, uh, if you follow his recipe, he'll get you this for free. Now, what you'd have, what you have to do is you have to extend this framework to include the par stuff. Right, that's the that's the main the main idea. Right. So there's a but there's a there's a fairly clear way to do this if you think about how the tuple space works. Right. Hopefully I've answered your so, question. Go ahead. So I'm thinking that uh, this is exactly what we have in, in reduce. We are basically matching on the uh, on the on the specific terms in in rolling, right? This this is a, a evaluate. So I'm thinking the, exactly the reducer is this thing. Hmm. So in which uh, when you say in 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 this shape, uh, in some kind of instead of just evaluating terms directly, uh, we would, uh, uh, in a sense, generate uh, some low level uh, bytecode, right? That's correct. You generate a bytecode. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the, the odd thing, so, so like, for example, when we were doing work on Rosette, um, uh, Mark Scable and Christine Thomason did this work before I joined the Rosette uh, team. Um, but what was astonishing was they had a, you know, a direct evaluator for Rosette and then they switched it over to a bytecode machine and the bytecode machine was orders of magnitude faster. So, so there is an advantage to going from a structure like this to a structure like this. And I'm not sure I can tell you why. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking uh, right now, basically, uh, we, we have serialized uh, uh, rolling, which we first, the, the, uh, the serialized, like uh, 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 putting in, the, in, a, in a heap so that we can uh, have, have uh, like higher level objects. And then we, we do the matching in, in uh, evaluate or reduce. Mm -hmm. And basically, if we can do this on the level of, uh, of the binary, uh, we can we can do the same thing. Yeah. If yeah. If, we, if we don't need to write this manual, because <laughs> I I, I would not <laughs> like to do this manual. Yeah. 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 Right. I mean, so 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 that that that's that's the other reason I'm suggesting that we form a pipeline so that we mm. we we break the problem down so you can you can you can move to a binary representation. Right. And if, mm. if you're, uh, and, and again, if the problem is broken down in this style, um, then going from here to uh, machine code, right? In other words, going from here to native is not such a big step as going from here to native or going from here to native, right? This, this is pretty close to native, right? So, and and that would be that's that's in some sense you know it it, it it's homologous to um, to the the Haskell pathway to native. Uh, Haskell is not factored in, in quite this way, but it's similar in spirit. Yeah, so 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 basically, uh, I was thinking we can we can map uh, uh, directly what we have. Uh, uh, um, in, in the memory, right? And, uh, and I see Roland in, in, in that in, in that sense. I see Roland as like higher level language, which, which can uh, give you a way to uh, change, uh, manipulate the memory, right? Yes. 
Yeah, that's which, essentially which all, is very all nice, right? right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, what, 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 the idea the idea of, of abstract channels is lovely, right? Because it maps onto memory, it maps onto URLs, it maps onto like so many different things. So yeah. All right. This is what, basically what we are doing, right? With any language, we are we are changing some 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 part of the files or part of the memory, and right. Oh yeah, for 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 sure. Okay. But we want to do in in some kind of uh, concurrent way, and, and this is why I see Owen really really uh, really uh, like important. Yeah, I mean, to 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 me, the the thing that's everything is kind of upside down and backwards, right? This is the model of concurrency. This thing here is the model of concurrency. And the fact that we're, well, we're having to fight the hardware representations of concurrency, right? I mean, the, the, the hardware representation is just, I mean, especially when you think about the Intel instruction set, it's awful. It's like, it's, it's just, just, you know, it's rat's nest. Um, it's not clean at all. Uh, and, 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 you know, I mean, I mean, it's, we're at a great point in history because that's all going to be redone. Uh, it should have been done 30 years ago, but, it, but at a minimum, it's, it's all being redone. And what we, what we really, really want is for this to become the blueprint for the hardware. That's the, that's the, 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 the goal, right? Is that, is that this is realized um, directly in terms of the structure of the chip, right? That's the, that's the, uh, the goal. Right, right now, we, you know, the, the, the way the chip is conceptualized is just, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna mince words, it's wrong. Um, and that's because people didn't have a, people didn't have a good way of thinking about concurrency. Now we have a good way to think about concurrency. <laughs> and so we can, we can, we can then reconceptualize the hardware and then the rolling part will be blazingly fast. All right. With that, I'm going to stop and I'll see many of you in the dev stand up. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.